Welcome back to what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. I'm Vincent Lancey, speaker and author of the book Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption. Want to know what it's really like to be an entrepreneur? Well, you came to the right place. Whether you're already an entrepreneur or looking to start your journey tomorrow or just someone who needs a little extra motivation to get through the day, this is the perfect podcast for you. This is the place where you will learn exactly what it's like as an entrepreneur and hear real-life authentic stories of entrepreneurs grinding on each episode. My goal for this podcast is to help you realize that giving up is never an option. If you missed last week's episode, be sure to download it after you tune in today. My guest on the show this episode is somebody I met when I was in graduate school at the John H. Sykes College of Business. He didn't pursue the corporate career after earning multiple degrees because he followed his dream and he's making an incredible difference. His story is one of true entrepreneurship and his hard work landed him on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. I'd like to now introduce my friend, Phil Michaels. Ben, thanks for having me. It's great to reconnect and congrats on the podcast. Thank you, man. It's great to have you. Why don't you go ahead and share your story and then end up what you're working on today before we hop in? Sure. Uh, Born in Philadelphia, raised in Atlantic City area. Actually, uh, Marvin Gardens on the Monopoly board, the yellow. Ah, A little fun fact. Um, And I was always an entrepreneur, but I never knew that could be a career choice. Started with the typical lemonade stand. Then I went on to sell Pokemon cards. And I remember selling a Charizard for $50 and I thought I had made it. I knew <laughs> That's life a big was going to be then. great after that. <laughs> it was a huge deal. And I thought I officially made it. Then in high school, I became a football bookie. And so I would sell football pools to friends <laughs> in high school. Eventually traveled to the University of Tampa where I fell in love with the city and the people ended up co-founding a nightlife promotion company while I was studying pre-med. I always wanted to be an eye doctor. So ended up working for the New York Yankees team physician. And uh, while I was with the Yankees, I ended up applying for a TV show called Shark Tank on ABC. You've probably heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, once or twice. A big entrepreneur show. And ended up becoming a finalist for season four. And at that moment, I became enthralled by the idea of being an entrepreneur. So I quit medicine to pursue entrepreneurship, and that was a very difficult conversation with my mom. She was oh, like, I can imagine. Who the hell quits the New York Yankees, and what the hell is an entrepreneur? <laughs> <laughs> so I decided at that moment to get a degree in business, and so I wanted to stand out amongst other students, so I decided to get a dual degree program and got my MBA and a Master's of Science in Marketing at the same time, which is where I was lucky enough to meet you. That's right. And then when I was in grad school, uh, I started an ed tech company, which is called Tembo Education, where, as you know, we educate zero to six-year-old children around the world using text messages and now WhatsApp. And our biggest customer is Nestle. And so this was the reason I was lucky enough to get published in Forbes magazine as a, one of the top 30 entrepreneurs under the age of 30. And that led me to what I'm doing now. After I got all this notoriety and, and success, a bunch of friends and people started asking me, hey, can you help me with my business? And so that's what led me to become a performance coach where I help people life coaching, business coaching, um, coaching mostly CEOs and entrepreneurs from Harvard and MIT since I lived in Boston for a while. But I also coach investors, engineers, salesmen, and even traders. And that's That's where I'm spending most of my time. That's a great story. Definitely one of true entrepreneurship. I'm starting to, once I start getting this podcast on the way, coaching has been a passion of mine. I want to work at starting with hospital patients, I think, and help them with situations like mine, you know, identify their goal, and then we'll work on some steps to get there because I know how the the struggle was and the journey and how much a little bit of help goes a long way. A little advice, a little push in the butt can get you over the hill. But Phil, I share an entrepreneurial story each week that's sure to inspire our listeners. I hope to give everybody different views and perspectives as entrepreneurships with our guests, but I also try with the stories as well. Don Voltaggio started working by bagging groceries at school. You may not know his name, but you'll know his products. His dad managed an A&P supermarket that was robbed on about 100 occasions. Don was constantly called out of school to go back to the crime scene, inspect what was robbed. He didn't believe that a high school degree would do much for his future, so he, he tried to drop out his junior year, but he stayed to make his mother happy. He started out his own brewing beer company in the 80s, and he gained publicity with a, quote, racy posters, the article said, and created a malt liquor drink that was named after a Sioux warrior, the Crazy Horse. 
It ended up getting banned by Congress because of Native American protests, but this kind of sparked his publicity and gave him some encouragement. He decided to go back into the drink business in the 90s where he created a 24-ounce can of iced tea priced below the competition at 99 cents and with flamboyant pastel colors in the can. You may have guessed the Arizona cans. He decided to use pastels because they were not used often at this point, and he thought that would help him disrupt the market by making a product that's even bigger than the competition and cheaper. Have you known that story, Phil? Incredible. I loved Arizona iced tea. It was a fan favorite as a kid. My buddies and I would go biking down to this place called the Linwood Market, and we would always uh, down one of those. They were affordable. You got a lot of quantity, and it was also a good tasting iced tea. Yeah, a lot of nostalgia with the, uh, the Arizona iced tea growing up. Absolutely, and it, it, like you said, it had the pastel colors that really stuck out amongst the crowd. And what I, I noticed see it, most man. Crazy. companies, they seem to be doing something unique, and they're the first ones to kind of tap into that new market, or as we call it in MBA school, a blue ocean strategy which yeah. simply means they're first to that respective market. And when I think of who had the best I see, I think of Arizona and I think of Snapple. And those companies... Oh, Snapple they, too, wow. Oh, so good. And then it, you pop the top and it had a little fun fact on the bottom. Little did I know that later on, about half of them are fake. And I half was so disappointed real. as well because I would argue <laughs> them too. And oops. And it seems to be... This validates Bill Gross's point when he did the famous TED Talk about what are the five variables that impact the startup success more than any other. And they were in this order. It was timing was number one. Execution of the team was number two. Idea was number three. Then business model and then funding. And when he said when he asked most people what they thought was going to be the most important, they always say funding. And it actually happened to be the least impactful on the success. And he did over 10,000 startups to mid-sized companies, to even growth sized companies like Uber and Airbnb. So it's interesting to see how that's validated with Arizona IC as well. Such an amazing story. It's a great career. Just go around opening businesses, see what, what sticks, <laughs> learn from them. But Phil, now we're getting to the big five. Each episode, I share these five questions with my guests to help each listener learn what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. You ready to go, man? Yes, sir. Great. We touched a little bit, but when did you first realize you weren't happy with what you were doing or maybe that you just needed a little change? I know we touched on the medical history a little bit, but I'd love to hear your response. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so when I was in pre-med school, I uh, didn't really enjoy the people I was around in the classroom and also nor were the classes I was taking other than anatomy and physiology. I love the human body, but not so much the botany or comparative anatomy of animals. <laughs> However, I just seem to follow this old adage that you just need to do good in school, work hard, and just slave your life away, and eventually you'll be successful. You buy a car, you know, have kids, buy a nice house, and then you die. And I just felt like it was a miserable life to live. So a friend actually gave me the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and I was mind blown. I was like, wow, this guy gets it. You don't have to just work your life away you can actually do what you would love to do what you're most passionate about and what you're best at and instead of working for your money make your money work for you um, however even though that philosophy got ingrained in my head it didn't stick with me and, and force me to out of that comfort zone until after i was already working in medicine while i was with the yankees until i applied for shark tank and eventually made that jump from medicine to business so if I had to give credit to anything for helping me make that shift, it was reading self-improvement books. That's the goal with this podcast too, Phil, to help people listening in improve. And when they see their first pit of piece of adversity, just help them realize that that will not be the only piece of adversity. Get used to the word no and things not working out. Keep moving but forward. Thank, that's a great answer. What would you say one or two of the most difficult parts of being an entrepreneur are? You had to narrow it down to two. Sure. There's a lot there, but I would say what most entrepreneurs I found don't understand, and I was guilty of this as well, is we typically hear the word, be your own boss. And I find most people, including myself, we misinterpret that term to mean we don't have a boss we have to answer to anymore. But what I found as the entrepreneur, you actually have to be two people. You have to be the employee 
and you have to be the boss to yourself. And it's easy to work for other people because they give you the work and you just follow it. Whereas it, yeah. as an entrepreneur, you have to give yourself the work and you have to follow it. So you have to be very self-motivated. And I think what most people starting out didn't realize beforehand is that it's actually more work to work for yourself, not less. However, as long as you know that going in, you can prepare yourself mentally for it and, and do great things. I, I find myself all the time. I touched on it on another episode where I'll start working to in the morning, 2.30, and next day I know it's dinner. No one's telling me to do anything. This is me. Yeah. So many ways for self-improvement, whether it's the website tweaks, social media, networking, doing templates, doing a speaking engagement. There's always something to be working on when you're passionate about it. I'm finally learning that overused quote of, it's never, it doesn't feel like work if, uh, you know, if you enjoy it, you'll never work a day in your life. And now I'm starting to realize that as I was speaking for years, but now with the book and the passion with this podcast, connecting with people every episode, chatting it up, learning your whole story, just such a great passion of mine and it's helping people along the way. So I'm all about it. Beautiful thing. Great. So those are good answers. What is one of your goodest, greatest failures, Phil? And what did it teach you? You had to pick one of your greatest failures. Well, I have a lot of failures, but when I think about failures, I think about them as just lessons that you can learn. And After, that yeah. failure will continue to repeat itself until you learn that lesson. And it will continue to show up in your life. And it's just letting you know, okay, you need to heed this advice. So I'd say if I had to pick one, it would probably be twofold. One would be not reading self-improvement books early enough. And then number two would be not building a succession plan, an exit strategy for the company as I was starting out. I waited too long to build that plan because even if you want to stay with the company forever, you should still have a plan and build your company as if you're either going to sell it, go public with it, or move from CEO to chairman of the board. So it's an important exercise to build this plan as soon as possible. And one thing I wish I would have done is, is in the early stages of the company, build that in from the get-go. That's a great piece of advice for everybody listening in, Phil, for sure. Thank you. If you could have a conversation, this is going to be a good one for you. I'm very interested to see who you'll pick. If you could choose to have a conversation with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who are we picking? What are you talking about? Yeah, I, I think the people that know me most know I'm going to say this, which is, is Tony Robbins. He's one of my idols since he's one of the few people in the world then that epitomize all success. He's not just successful in one aspect of life, one area of life. You meet a lot of people out there, the Warren Buffett, the people that are very financially successful, but maybe they have a poor health or a poor body or poor relationships. And what I find with Tony is he seems to be successful in all areas of life when it comes to social, emotional health, his physical body, his finances, his career, the impact that he's serving others with. And I think that he is really someone that is, has a holistic view, a comprehensive approach to success in all areas of life. So that's someone I really admire and look up to. And I would love to uh, sit down with and talk about future life with. I love the reasoning behind why you picked Tony. So thanks for going into detail with that. It's very true. In my book, I talk about one point, health is wealth. If you don't really have health, then what do you really have? If you're sick, if you're, you have constant health issues, what does it matter how much money you have or what does it matter which car you're driving or the TV you have? Because it's, it's your body, it's, it's your life. And what's the, fir exactly, and what's the first thing that you do when you get that new car or hit that new milestone financially or whatever it may be career-wise? You share it with others. You share it with the ones you love. And if you're unhealthy and you're not able to do that or you have poor relationships, what is it worth? I couldn't agree more, Phil. I'm glad we're connected on that one. We, now we're just interesting. We talked about an exit strategy. We talked about where you started with Tembo. Let's look into the future a little bit at one year and five years. Where do you see yeah. yourself and your entrepreneurial endeavors in one year from today? It's a great question. And uh, it seems fitting for the time of year right now. My girlfriend and I are building our 2020 plan, and we just did the review of 2019. And I would say there's three main areas I want to focus on. One is from my self-improvement obsession and, and coaching. I've taken the best of what I've learned from 
all the idols out there and all the productivity journals I've ever used. And I've combined it into one. I took the best from everything I've learned and put it into one. I'm going to be re releasing that in 2020. So I'm excited about that. That's awesome. That's one goal I want to achieve and what I'm looking forward to. Um, number two is I'm eventually going to move to chairman of the board of my ed tech company. So I'll continue to grow my coaching business full time and impact as many people in a positive way as possible. That's my true passion. Awesome. And then lastly, number three is I host a men's retreat every year called the bro treat. And it's in a different city every year. And it's a place for high achieving men to push each other mentally, physically, emotionally in a trusted environment, okay. kind of a place for us to travel and have fun but with purpose. And it's been growing every year. So I'm going to look forward to growing that this year. This year it's in Vancouver, Canada. So I'm really excited about right. taking, this is the first time we're taking it international. So I'm Thanks excited so. about that. Thanks for sharing all that, Phil. I know our listeners are going to see a ton of value in your episode today. I really enjoyed you, re enjoyed you resonating with the audience, you skipping from a pre-med, one of those big time degrees in future careers as far as quick financial uh, outputs to following your passion and looking how it turned out now, patience, building the foundation, and now you're following your passion with coaching, having that flexibility. Phil, it's time for the last word. Is there something you'd like to share with our listeners today that we didn't get to touch on at all? Thanks, Ben. I would say what I've realized doing my 2019 review is how impactful having people fighting for you in your corner is. So surround yourself with people that are pushing you to be a better version of yourself every single day. That's a great answer. I'm the same way. Everybody you try to keep in your inner circle has big aspirations, not only for themselves, but for you. They care about you like your family, and it does go a long way. Now, will you please share your social media, Phil, ways for our listeners to follow you, perhaps sure. your services? I'd love to. Um, so on Instagram, you can find me at I am Phil Michaels. And if you're looking into the EdTech company, it's temboeducationgroup.com. Great. Thanks for sharing. And everybody go check those out. You guys can follow the show on Instagram at your favorite morning podcast and on Twitter at Podcasts by Lancey. My channels are at Vincent A. Lancey on all social media and YouTube. And my website is vincentalancey.com. Make sure to grab my book, Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption, on Amazon now. DM me or email me. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed today's episode with Phil, please continue listening and rate what it's really like to be an entrepreneur five stars. I work very hard to find value delivering stories for you on each episode. And as always, I'll follow the show with a quote that inspired me, and I know it will for you too. The power of imagination makes us infinite. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you all in the next episode of what it's really like to be an entrepreneur.